Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of stories from across the internet. In this series, we'll be focusing on a web novel called There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we'll be doing chapter 66.5 to 68. I hope that you enjoy. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 66.5 Side Story The Village of Woodedly Grosh Woodbourne looked at his men with a grimace. It finally has a boss, he repeated the words. His son, a man more of action than thinking to him, nodded stoutly. Snakes. Everywhere you go in the thing makes snakes. Don't know if that's normal or it might be a little... He trailed off and Grosh gave him a deadly look. He stood up from his chair and a wooden thing with many animal skulls fitted onto it. The hunter's throne showed power, but it also showed the end of a great hunter. Unless one was willing to travel beyond the woods, through the marshes and well, a predator knew where it belonged. The wolf was mighty, but the dragon was just unfair. That all changed when the child fell into what seemed like an odd snake pit. They were too late to help him, but the hole widened quickly, and they saw that no mere pit. It was a cave and followed out of the great moor with subtle scent of manner. Already the monster's attacks had increased. Sickly goblins, lizard tribes, the beasts of the deep woods. Everything had been done so balanced before the dungeon had appeared. Now Grosh could barely predict the direction that the wind would howl over the beasts. He had lost his youngest to an attack by goblins, weak things that even dozens of knives would bring down a wolf. His son rested now. Grosh turned to the gaps in the ranks. Men lost trying to explore the dungeon. Grosh had been to the few before that they were all so different, and it was useless to compare beyond the basic means. This dungeon sat near the dead end cliff that used to protect the village from the rear attacks, then used to offer a measure of comfort. Now, it was a towering reminder of how the new demon looked behind their defenses. Rough fences and quick patrols had been set up, but now did one capture mana? How did one slash a hole in the soil? Then the snakes began to hiss, a horrid, endless noise that flowed through the night. They all came from the dungeon. Men coming out reported nothing but snakes. The dungeon had a fascination with them and an unhealthy degree. But spoiled with snakes, trip wires that dropped snakes on you, doors that led to rooms and when open unleashed a flood of the little bastards. The dungeon itself hadn't been bothered with decoration or proper rooms. It seemed just to want to fill every inch of itself with writhing, wriggling, hissing snakes. But it had to obey the rules. The only thing that made any of this livable was that the rules of Weising. The dungeon could not block the exit nor entrance, and the dungeon could not live outside itself unless an offer is made. A dungeon must produce mana. A dungeon must. The team is ready. A stout woman cried, her axe and a long chub and blinded from the previous night's work. Grosh stood and grabbed his spear. Then let us hunt. He thundered, and he led the way out of the hut that howled the hunter's throne. With one last thought, Grosh wondered who would occupy it next. Not his problem, it was never the hunter's problem who came after his bones long settled. The village of Woodedly was one of the practical make. No hut was made bigger than needed, no path was paved beyond the main. Water wells were basic but hardly decorative. Woodedly had the trait to share with his people. Brutal efficiency. He walked past his woman. She was sharpening a long knife. You know what to do. If I'm not to return, he began, before she poised the knife under his throat. Her red hair are that of fire. Her eyes like black steel. Her face utterly like stone. Man of mine, do not make stupid jokes. The daughters will have the rage ball meat on the table by sundown. If you aren't there again, I'll hunt you down. She warned and stalked off, her lips to the sight to behold. The mother to his children, and the knife to his throat. Grush could have found no finer woman if he hunted the lands day and night. It was common knowledge, after all, that she hunted him, and took a prize. Allowing that little message of love to turn to a small smile on his face, he turned to the men and women waiting for orders. 
You heard her. No use for goodbyes. Wasted air when you will be seeing them again all soon. He grumbled and headed to the rear gate of the village, as a wide-eyed children and their toy spears and stuffed beasts looked up as the group left. He had been such a child once. Back then, didn't everything seem brighter? Now, these children, a product of his reign and hunting, would now suffer a very different hunt from the one that he'd grown up with. For, as much as they could carve out the danger of the dungeon, they could not strike at the heart. Grosh could not remove the threat and hang it on his wall. Or he could, but the king's law was a dragon stronger than he could ever be, and that would mean the end of Woodley. For months, almost half of the passing of the seasons, the dungeon had grown. Sure, they had slowed its progress by starving it of wandering beasts and only sending the criminals or braves into the dark grasps. But Grosh knew that each leaf that blew in, each rat that was lured in by the meaty smells, each bug. This dungeon had seemed to manage override to the local animal's fear of dungeons. It used smells of seasoned rodents and spoiled meat to make the animals ignore their sense of fear. In the woods, fear was constant, but free food was not. Inch by inch, the dungeon had grown fat off the morsels. If it had managed to gain the rage boar or a horde of goblins, well, Grosh knew that he'd be looking at a much more vile place. No matter what it devoted, the dungeon of Woodley only produced one thing so far. They had heard sounds clearer as they arrived at the entrance. Grosh had been wrong. The dungeon had spent some energy elsewhere. The entrance now looked like an open bore of a snake, the crude eyes leaking what seemed like blood. Dramatic, Jorna spat, a seasoned hunter who could such evil things with trap wires. She had been around for about the same length of time as Grosh, a good eye for such a place as this. Her arrows weren't bad either. The dungeon entrance was set into the cliff, and the stone around it was pale white compared to the red dirt of the cliff that was supposed to be made up of. The ground before them was desolate and wet, as if something was bubbling just below the surface. The smell was moist and thick with the stench of beasts. The dungeon how it warped everything around it, how the very balance of life in this area that had taken generations to form were now all a whim of this accursed hall. More monsters would move in, leaving their previous homes free for more vile things to move in. Food became scarce and the manor began to warp everything out of control. Their home. What would become of it? Would the children of Woodley become infused with bestial manor? Would they grow scales and forked tongues? Would the taint of the snake run free through them all? Grosh knew that there were ways of deflecting or redirecting mana, but their maintenance and cost required a grand mage. Even then, it was not perfect. The only way to escape mana was to have more mana than the outside threat or run away. Grosh didn't want to doubt his people where the dungeon would only grow. Would they, too, become the bird folk of the errant mountain? The dungeon there had warped them all, and they welcomed it. The great lake of the west had made the people blue. Cultures boiled around dungeons as their sickly manner changed them. But for a culture to rise, their ways had to die, and Grush would fight that until the end. They chose when to change, not when the snake pit forced them to. With me, he ordered, and the group of ten or more nodded. Grush took the lead, the most dangerous spot of the hunting group, but he would hardly allow some runt to take the spot. If there was to be bloodshed, then his would be the first, then he would blind his foes with it. The first few steps in were safe. They must be, or the laws would be broken. The open space before him held spires of stone and crude statues of snakes coating them. Some looked decent enough to pass off rough snakes as one squinted. Why did we get the snake dungeon? The younger male grunted. Cause it obviously grew near the pit of the cliff winders. Eat them all up and fell in love. Now it just wants to make more and more of them. Dungeons do that. They fixate on whatever they eat first. The older woman explained, all the while looked after the bow in her hands. So what if we fitted a ton of healing herbs and gold, then maybe we could finally be useful. A girl snapped, feisty, but he would need to cull that idea fast as the others perked up. 
influencing a dungeon to change it to our needs is illegal by decree of the king of the land. A dungeon cannot be made to desired form by the locals or it has then served only the locals. Too many dungeons are wasted due to being nothing more than taverns on demand or rich smice dens. Too many dungeons learned how to turn even those into weapons. Then all that was left was a hole that the only reward one could get out of it was a stiff drink or an illegal high. He growled, What a waste. This dungeon before them seemed to be doing it all by itself. What good was the snakes to a king? Hence why, if he wanted it to help it sooner or later, Grosh would have to prove that this dungeon was worthy of the king's attention more than any other. Any treasure, any hint of something more than snakes. Then he could get the noble bastards down here, and he let them deal with it. Six months of snakes are just the beginning. Have patience, by the tax collector. The blaster man hadn't even bothered to tour the dungeon like he was supposed to. Just snakes, that's all he wrote on the clipboard. But there had been nothing but snakes in the short skirmishes that he had which was why now Grosh was going to dive deeper than ever before. The other scouts had seen a boss room being prepared, and today they had seen a door. A boss had arrived. He could only guess what it would be, but the boss was the secondary to the full mapping, and the most important thing was finding anything else that could raise the dungeon's value from a measly monster den to something worth the blasted snakes. He took a few more steps into the stall corridor leading in from the entrance. Loose put her head to the left. Sounds like it's filled with snakes. Jorna said quietly. Grosh didn't need this at his back. He relied on his spear and gave the woman near the back, who held potions and vials around her hip with a belt. Kanu, the alchemist, was the closest that they had to a proper healer in the village. Taking her in was showing how desperate Grosh really was. She threw a bubbling bottle at the pit and fire erupted, as shadowy forms of writhing snakes burned up. She shuddered and the first of the flyers showed holes, not in the floor, but little rat tunnels all along the sides of the wall, so many tiny little pockmarks to hide the snakes. Even the ceiling held these holes. It's a clever beastie. It knows how to really use snakes and our fear of them. Jorna huffed. She reached down and used a ramp stick to scoop up some of the lingering fire to make a torch. This dungeon had no intention of making any light for itself. For snakes, the dark held no danger. I th th thought the dungeon could only use so many monsters. The young man hooned cried. Jorna nudged the crumbling snake. These ain't monsters, just critters. Lot less limits on these than it looks, like they got some pretty sharp fangs. If there aren't any monsters in here, there's a lot of snakes. She mused. Hewn looked around, his sword shaking slightly. Hundreds, all thousands. Well, we'll behead them all. Onwards, Grosh growled and moved on. No hole moved and no hole made even a whisper. It was like the dungeon had got silent. It wasn't used to this many people or fire. Grosh had a feeling that this place had grown comfortable as a dangerous being. It had not expected that the things from outside to use fire or were present as an actual threat to it. Grosh wondered if it had ever lost any snakes before. If it just spoke or did something, then Grosh could have negotiated. Working something out about this dungeon's mindset was to devour and coil, and far too shallow to have anything resembling human thought. How could a man argue with such an alien mind without it even wanting to try? It was folly and he was reduced to mapping the area for the damned lazy taxman. The first room was oddly devoid of holes for snakes. Jorna choked and the walls instead of her long extended curved spikes and the walls bulging as if giant snakes were trying to burst through. It's an artist, Grosh said bluntly and walked past them. Jorna watched them all and with a careful eye, but the room was nothing more than a place the dungeon played in. So far, the space was straight, one room after the other. Grosh would miss this when it came to understood that bending them into different paths and making them choose between them would double their time spent in the wasted here. 
Hune moaned as he saw a thin bridge ahead in the next room. It went straight like a path, but below was the dark water that dozens of tiny forms slithered in. The finders hate water, Jonah reminded Grosh as if he was a new hunter of the day group and not the hunter. Yet these snakes are green and not red. The dungeon is learning how to make new types. For a critter, it isn't the worst, but doesn't bode well for us having a clever dungeon on our lands. He frowned and cleared his throat. So keep steady and don't fall in. He ordered and took a bridge first. It supported his weight and it only had enough space for one person to walk across. He made it across. Jonah fired an arrow with a tightrope. Grosh grabbed it where he spiked it into the wall. He tied it carefully around the static tight and watched Jonah tie the other end securely around the side, giving the rest a secure balanced rope to use. Not so much for coming across, but just in case they had to leave very carefully. The snakes hissed angrily. All at once, they didn't seem to like the rope nor their use of it to circumvent the bridge. Just because we have to play along doesn't mean that we have to do it like fools, Grush muttered at the red eyes of the demon. Most likely, it was the dungeon that was being annoyed, no matter how basic a mind it may possess. No one liked to think that they were clever and got proven wrong. Once they were all across, Grush almost appreciated the dungeon's single-minded focus on snakes. No monsters made this place dangerous, but also not as bad as it could have been. The next room was a nest, so to speak. The biggest number of snakes yet covered the floor and walls before a mightily scaled covered door. Kanu threw more bottles and fire erupted. Oil spread and their fire quickly. Snakes burned by the dozen, the fumes not healthy in a cave, but they all retreated to the water room and idly chopped or shot at any snakes that slithered up the tunnel. Once the air was semi-decent to breathe, they breathed to the room slowly. Hewn carefully seemed to grow more confident the more snakes' bodies that crumbled around his feet. He grinned and looked around. This dungeon isn't so bad. Maybe we can find a way to harvest snake skins. Can't healers make powerful antidotes with venom of snake? He asked brightly. Grush ignored the question and Kano hummed. Depends, some venoms are too toxic to really work. But snakes are hardly unified or a simple species. Even if I could milk a snake, the substance wouldn't last too long outside the dungeon. I would need a drop or some treasure to give substance to the lasting effect, Kano said quietly. We kill a lot of snakes, yet to see anything drop, Jonah commented to the group. Critters don't often have the potential for treasure. Monsters usually do the lifting in that area. Grosh said calmly Hume scowled. So this dungeon ripped another potential to help our village out of our hands. I hate this place. He complained and leaned against the wall like the arrogant youth he was. Grosh saw it before he could react. A dark grey wall suddenly moved and a grey stone snake that had been biding its time lashed out and bit Hoon on the neck. The woman beside him pierced the snake with a well-aimed arrow. Hoon screamed as he fell. It burns, it burns, he moaned. Grosh dragged him by his feet to the center of the room as Kano bent down to take a look. Stop panicking, let me see. She snapped and Jono grabbed Hune's arms to help. The blood leaked out of his neck. Kano stripped a bandage and sighed. The wound leaked venom out of its own. Blood is clean, he's just being dramatic. She sighed and Hune shivered as she pressed the bomb into the wound and she wrapped it up. Hune, don't touch anything. I swear by the horned wolf I will remove your hands myself. Grosh warned, he didn't need more people dead. Hune was barely of age to join this trip and only because he damn well begged Rosh for a week straight. Honestly, the kid's tenacity wasn't bad. Shame that he was a bit better suited for raising bees or helping plants grow. Fine professions, but being a hunter had its lure to the young ones. Hune nodded weakly and Kano helped him stand. Her medical skills a secondary gift from her love of crafting magical potions. The boy would need to leave soon, but they would do it together as a group. Splitting up there was a fool's choice at this point. Cliff winders, water snakes, and now these rock snakes. More than I'd hoped, but not as bad as I feared. Grush muttered he still didn't see anything worth it in this cave beyond snakes. How can one dungeon be so obsessed over one thing? 
Weren't these places supposed to be filled with treasure and lures? Why did his village have to be cursed with the only dungeon to be made of death? He pushed open the door. The heavy thing was covered in a rippling of snakeskin, smooth and sleek as his hand pushed on it. The space beyond showed that Grosh had it all wrong. The boss room was like an ancient ruin, made of rough stone covered in a long foreign pillars on ruin. Many deep holes had been made in the walls and floors that led to who knows where. The ceiling draped down with very long vines that made the place feel old but not dead. From the middle of the ceiling, a large white snake slowly lowered itself down. Fangs exposed. The liquid that dribbled down from the fangs hit the stone and hissed violently. But Grosh couldn't focus on that entirely. His eyes were drawn beyond, to the end of the room. Because at the far side of the room were two important things were visible. The back was like a shrine. Clear-cut stone steps led to an altar with ten-headed snake statue leering down at a person who would pray there. The simple table made of stone took up all the space. One was the dungeon core. It had yet to make a room for itself beyond the boss room. It sat inside an oddly large golden chalice. The chalice was a beautiful thing, with carved depictions of snakes devouring the sun stamped up onto it. Even from here, Grosh could feel the magic coming off of it. The core sat in a chalice like an egg in a cup. The dungeon core had not found the pit of cliffwinders as its first meal. It had devoured. Become one with its magical object that must have been buried here by Grosh's ancestors. A magical item that the core used as its pedestal. The magical item had it turned slowly and merged into the core, becoming one with it. This explained a lot. It also gave Grosh a mad smile as he saw now how he would save this village. First, he would have to kill the large white snake. It's form diving into the nearby tunnel to play the ambush game with them. Snakes were all the same. His village had hope. Cores with access to old magical items were of great worth to the kingdom. Whatever the chalice was, there was now a symbol of hope. If they made it out alive. Grosh raised his spear and leapt forward, the hunter blood throwing through him. Fire and venom rained down, and the young were wounded and fought fought. But as the sun set, he was home. He was grinning like a wild beast at his shocked wife. Get the peacekeeper, he needs to get the taxman here, so that I can rub his smug face in this. He ordered, holding up a vial of the dark golden liquid that he collected from the chalice of the core. Kanu had almost wet herself when she studied it. He grinned as soon swing his new serpent sword and tipped hissed over so slightly. The village of Woodley would survive. The snakes had made it so. The chalice of the snakes had the answer. Grosh watched as his people cheered, and even the growls of the distant monsters could not dampen the spirits of the hunters that night. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 67. Keys and Doors. Delta watched as step one of her plan was formed. The tunnel to the wyam groaned as three large stone doors formed. The thick stone sapped a lot of her mana, but Delta felt pleased at the thickness of the stone promised that no one could punch through unless they were from durance. They was almost faceless, but the system wouldn't allow Delta to simply seal the tunnel off and have no way to clear it with human limits. In the middle of all three doors was a simple keyhole. Davina held out a similar stone key and slid it into the first lock. The key went in all the way, and she stood back as the door slid down, taking the key with it. The nimble enough person might be able to snatch it back. Dancer would have to add some sort of twister or catch to the door. The first door slid down to simply reveal another stone door. Frustrating, but Delta was sure that people would accept it if they were used to a dungeon. Besides, the keys were more easily found after the next step of her plan. With a command, she brought the door back up, and Davina took the key back. I still think it's too much of a hint. Let them wonder. Information will spread before we can stop it anyway. Delta shook her head. No, best to make sure that we give everyone a fair shake and therefore nobody should go crazy and try to murder Bob or the frogs for keys. She replied, Davina merely looked calm as she cut in. Not defenseless, she reminded Delta. 
But yeah, doesn't mean that I want someone to try and gut you every moment of every day. Nalta disagreed. She moved forward and adjusted her tie. Besides, you're the wandering guide that trades information for people's valuables. Delta commented dryly to Vienna smiled pleasantly, just enough to set them on the right path. She agreed. Delta closed her eyes and with a little push of manner to the surface of the stone door before her, crumbled to show two images. A simplistic carving and the rock showed the bee sampling of a flower and the other side was a picture of a deep pool behind the waterfall. Lizzie and Bob, the key to the first door, would be found at either. Below she scribbled in a simple sentence, Face the nest of sweet, but take none, dive deep where there is no sun. One key will open the way, but if it is covered in blood, you will be facing the lady of the forest this day. Poetic, you know idiots will think that I have to wash the key and not that they don't kill, right? Perhaps we should add a clear warning with big words. Sarcasm isn't handy. This is your idea and sort of mine. You wanted things to be interesting, so I'm making a theme. Now, on to the second. I like making rhymes, so I'm some ancient elvish door maker. Delta grinned, and the door lowered, and her command, she turned to Davina. Here, take this and go to the other key to the bee nest in Bob's pool. Explain what they have to do. I won't be long before New will buy them later. Delta promised, and Davina, as she formed the second key, that was already tuned to the first door. She called it the Door of the Wild. The next door had her thinking, now, this needed a bit more of a personal touch. The stone shaved away from the surface of the second door to form to her two images, two faces, one keyhole. Delta stood back to admire her work and the faces of Luna and Giant appeared. They both had an area, so to speak, she would have to add a challenge to the hot springs, but the giant was easy enough. Rest your weary soul in the peaceful spring. Face the giant on the bridge. Challenge his mighty swing. The test of trust and a test of skill. But be warned, let there be no blood drawn in lust. The thorns are watching. A bit long, but it would be worried if some might take challenge as some permission to kill the giant if they knocked him off the bridge. Having already made a single key for each door, Delta formed the second key as she called Luna and Giant. Their being split into awareness at a call. Luna was flickering light of energy, while Giant was more akin to a calm candle. Delta named the second door quickly in her head. The Door of People. Delta eyed her screen and was glad to see that she had enough mana to finish the last door if she didn't go overboard with carving it. New had convinced her that this one but Delta was really not sure it was a good idea. The stone shivered as Delta worked on the images. Before long, a series of tiny pygmy mushrooms looked out from the door next to them, a circus tent. Delta felt a little uneasy sending people off to the little folks, but New assured her that they were quick on their feet. Delta guessed that being lost, the adventurers might be more tired. She got to work on the message. The last door seeks the final key. Seek the little ones in the dark. Look up in awe at the ringleaders park. The key will be found at the heart of their room. Seek not their end, or you invite your doom. Dramatic? I like it. Maybe add a line about their spleens and eyeballs. Hmm. No, that would be too gouache. Now we need to drop these keys off, and step three will begin. New's excitement was a little infectious, but it wasn't like Delta wasn't feeling the same. As it was now, getting the keys to the Pygmies and Rennie would be uh, rather quick if they managed to remain polite to the mime, unless he decided to put on a show, of course. Both areas were in need of some improvements. Delta looked around and wondered where Hob and Gob were. They usually did not take too long to gathering things up. The spider smashed the fallen log out of its way, and the goblins ran for the lies back to the clear zone. Spider, big now! Gob grunted as the monster behind them chased him with a rampant rage. Gob just ran faster. They had beaten one spider with ease since it was only the size of a pig, but the gobs soon learned that they were merely met with a new breed of children. The spider abruptly stopped, dirt flying everywhere and its legs dug in deeply to halt his movements. 
The goblins kept running for a bit, but then turned to see that the spider hesitate before it twitched. It moved forward and a step before it was almost yanked back. It ran quickly back into the deep woods of the trees. Weird. Spider didn't care before. Hob itched his sweaty nose. Spiders are weird bugs. But big now, Gob agreed. Looking around, they weren't too far from the path to the village and even closer to home. Maybe Delta scared it off. Gob amused, but he's headed towards the dungeon. Maybe scary humans in village. Hob added, Well, Delta, that needed bigger pointy things and booms go deeper. Gob stated, Hob just shook his head. Wish Shua could come. This would be easier with fire. He sighed as he turned the puzzle on the door to the right place. The spider returned to the deep webbed part of the forest as it quickly hurried to where it was directed. High above in a round cocoon deep blood red web, a voice sounded out. Not the right time. Dig, dig, we shall feast soon, my children. A curling whirl starts as the sun goes down. The weak here will perish and make rooms for the strong. Devour the weak and make, my side, my children, eat and grow. The voice commanded, and this was followed by the wet tearing noises, weak ones being found. Their numbers dropped, but their power rose. The spider quickly dived deep into the rough tunnel that had been carved. The mutants had formed a potent venom to melt the stone, but not flesh, worked until they died. Such is the way the strong survive and the new breed would gather strength quicker than the old. He attached his silk to the hollowed-out animal used as a cart for the dirt to be carried out. Dig, dig, dig. Spiders? Didn't they vanish? Delta blinked, thinking back to the monsters that had been broken in a long time ago. Leary ate us. They hide in good things deep in the woods. Hob promised. Gob nodded enthusiastically in agreement. That was the problem. A lot of her manna came from the two gobs returning every so often with things. If they said that they had got deeper because they were running out of things to discover. Well, Delta had no problem trying to fix that. She opened both their menus. There wasn't a straight up upgrades per se, but there were some options that she could give them. Hob. Goblin contracted monster. Gob. Goblin contracted monster. Both were pretty simple with the items that they had equipped. Basic wooden armor and wooden weapons. She could get them better equipment, but unlike her other monsters, she couldn't give them passives or evolve them. There was another set of options, however. Gob has gathered enough experience to form the Bander class. Bandit, a person who is apt in ambushing and using one-handed weapons to deliver heavy blows. Their talent at moving through the wild gives the unit increased fighting abilities when outside a city or near a road. Delta quickly checked on Hob. Hob has gathered enough experience to form the Scout class. Scout, this unit has increased tracking and stealth skills. They excel at ranged weapons like archers, but also gain skills in daggers. When exploring, they are more aware of their surroundings. Jobs. Her contracted monsters had gotten jobs instead of evolving. Delta saw each one cost 20 DP, which wasn't bad, so to speak. Could Delta do this for all of her contracted monsters? Could she upgrade Rennie's class? Questions for later. She purchased both upgrades and her goblins blinked at the screens before them. Both gave each other a grin before they hit yes on their screens. They glowed slightly, but they didn't change in any noticeable way. Are you guys all right? Delta asked, how blinked himself. I know how to use a bow and arrow and a knife better. He nodded and Gob looked pleased. I know how to best smash a head in. He bragged before he coughed politely at Delta's deadpan expression. Luckily, Delta had spent some DP to form items that she had never made before. She formed a simple steel helmet and a sturdy leather vest for Hob before conjuring up a basic bow and a quiver for him. She imagined a crossbow might be a bit unwieldy when trying to move quickly and he needed to stop and reload. She gave him a cheap-looking serrated dagger to sit at his hip. Honestly, Delta really did feel that the elf queen right now, giving out gifts to small people about to fight giant spiders. For Gob, she gave him a simple helmet and a crude brigadine 
to his exposed arms. In one hand, he carried a simple wooden shield with a metal border, and the other a large club with an iron cap head. Her DP dinked down, but she didn't mind if it kept her two goblins safe. You know how to use them, the other asked with a smile. There was a confidence in them that they lacked before. Yeah, I'll bring you tons of spiders. Hob promised, and Gob snapped the metal club on a few times against his leg. I'll bring spider smears. He grinned. Delta watched as they ran back outside, armed with their new equipment and jobs. She wondered if, unlike evolution, they would simply get better on their own due to the power of jobs. Could Delta evolve their jobs once they hit a some limit to their skills? It was an interesting idea, and one they would have to watch out for, until she could ask Rudy or Chris for the details. She took a peek at Waddles and saw a few seconds later as he peered at the menu. Waddles, Dark Drake, Contracted Monster. This creature has enough experience to gain a job. Would you like to pay 1500 DP for the Overlord job? Dalta shakily closed the menu and backed away from the staring duck. You go back to sleep and stay unemployed. Please, Dalta said nervously. Mwah. The key of the bees was set at the very top, inside where the flowing honey was made. The key had taken on a golden sheen. Oddly enough, as Lizzie, the queen accepted her role as the key guardian. So swarm, but don't sting, unless they get nasty. If they can climb up here in the honey-coated rock and reach in without fear, they passed. Then they try to smoke you or something, then scare them off. Delta explained, happy to throw herself back into her work and forget about the potential overlord duck business. The queen merely nodded. Delta grinned and floated slightly away. She opened the two menus, one for Lizzie and one for the area. Lizzie, Red Jungle Bee, Queen Key Guardian. The queen of the hive, this queen makes sure that her hive thrives and her children grow. Upgrades. Honey is produced at double speed. 15 DP. The queen can now produce rare specialized species of red bee. 20 DP. The sting of the queen now induces a fever. 15 DP. The queen can produce a rare golden honey drop that can boost mana of anyone who consumes it. 30 DP. Lizzie had some great upgrades, but Delta only had 67 DP left. But it was tempting to try and get some of the upgrades, but she held her points until she checked up the next menu. Red Jungle Beehive, a large stone pillar in which the red bees live in service of the queen. Upgrades, the honey acts as a painkiller and it now has extra nutrients, 12 dp. Grey bees can now be bred. These bees can form a stone-like liquid that will harden and extend the nest, 25 dp. Princess bees can be formed to make their own hives. The current queen will control all princesses from afar, 30 dp. There was some synergy here. Delta could see how the honey becoming better slotted nicely into the queens producing it and the double the speed. Delta purchased both upgrades, which left about 40 DP. Nodding, she also got the ability for Lizzie to make a rare specialized bees, leaving her with 20 DP. Having more options would be good. With Hob and Gob ready to take on tougher foes, she was sure that her mana and DP was going to explode soon. Plus, if the honey lasted a few days outside, then she could get an inn in the honey market. Maybe Mrs. Dabagos would help us sell it. Nolan's words were still fresh in her mind. Become valuable. Produce rare items, and the kingdom would be open to hearing her requests. If they knew that she was willing to keep producing items of all sorts, then maybe she could request peaceful interactions. Or at least make Durant stand up for her. Wandering over to the hot springs, Delta watched as Luna painted the wooden fence that separated the spring into halves. Using crushed flowers and fruit, she used her fingers to paint a rather good attempt at a moon in the sky on one side and a rising sun on the other. Delta looked about as Luna carefully made her way out of the hot spring and shook herself off. If you're looking for the key, I stuffed it between the two fire crystals. Not really anywhere else to put it. Luna said brightly. Delta looked at the art. You're very good at that. She praised and Luna shrugged. You made my world. 
not exactly impressive when compared to my doodle lot of fins. Luna disagreed politely, and Dalta gave her a long look. I'll get you some painting things soon, she informed the young frog who opened her mouth to argue before Dalta grinned. I know what it feels like to be stuck here with nothing to do. Dalta replied kindly. Luna shook her head. I would never complain about home, and... Luna was cut off by Dalta gently hugging her. You're allowed to. That's the beauty of it. She smiled softly. Luna frowned. But every inch of me screams that I shouldn't. I had impulses to stop talking and bow. I have the urge to simply nod and agree with you. Luna looked away as if lost. Dalta merely shrugged. Then here is an order for you. Ignore those voices and be yourself. That should give you all the permission you need. Dalta bent down to open up the menu. Be Luna, the frog whispered to herself. Hot Springs, a small secluded area where a peaceful stream invites the tide to rest. Upgrades, increase the healing properties of the water. Minor injuries can be treated by the session. 20 DP. Surround the spring with bamboo to create more ambience. 15 DP. Let the water cure the weak status effects. 30 DP. Unlocked by weak antidote. Double the size of the hot spring. 15 DP. Allow monster Luna to become the keeper of the spring. Keeper of the spring will gain more powers around the spring and be able to adjust the spring's properties slightly. 20 DP. That was perfect. Luna wanted to become the hot spring keeper and own the place. She asked casually. What are the hours like? came the cheeky reply. Never ending, I would assume, but the breaks are great. Delta promised cheerfully. Luna nodded and Delta got the upgrade. Luna's change was simply dressed frog girl to what appeared to make Delta's jaw drop. The simple cloth wraps gone, and in their place a lavish purple robe, almost like a kimono, hugged Luna's frame. The fabric decorated with symbols and stars and half moons. Luna was still lacked hair as a frog, but her eyes and face had become more feminine. Luna, you look great, Delta beamed. Did you know that there were 56 ways to kill a man in a hot spring? 82 if I use both hands. Luna greeted cheerfully. Delta's smile twitched, but she held on strong. Great. How do you feel as a keeper? She inquired excitedly. Luna gave the robe a long look and then lifted up slightly to show the very black boots that Delta guessed were actual stilettos or heels. I feel like... It's elegant. Yeah, that's the word, elegant. She smirked as her black shoes were once again hidden under the robe and grace and delicacy. Dalta supposed it could be worse. Usually when things like this happen, she ended up screaming or crying, or both. Luna clicked her fingers and a key slowly rose up from the surface of the water and she neatly pocketed it. Dalta noticed that the stone key looked smaller and had a purple string looped through it. Delta was about to comment on how cute it was when something floated past her face. It was a bee. But this wasn't just like the other bees Delta had in the jungle. No, the queen had apparently gotten lucky in her first new batch of children. This bee was a monster. Luna whistled. I'd be scared, but it's awesome. She said, and Delta slowly backed away from the super major bee. That was the size of her head. The oversized head it possessed looked at her, mandibles slowly closing. The wings beat fast, almost a blur. The body curved down like a dagger until it came to the stinger, which was the size of a pinky. Dalton knew that the thing wasn't falling off after one use. It moved closer to her, its hulking form slower and not more the threatening. You're right, Mum. You're kind of white, and since you're orange, that's saying a lot. Luna's voice was so distant, so far away. The bee opened its wings and legs to their full width as if showing off. There was a gap in Delta's memory after that, but Nu found her gibbering in the pygmy hole. She gestured wildly at him, and he merely looked pleased. You should see what else that bee is pumping out. You're gonna need to increase the size of your flowers. They kind of crush whatever they try to get nectar from. I think they're depressed. You advised. Now Dalta had an image of a sad giant bee from hell and she became torn in her heart. 
So, peeking out, she watched as one of the big devils to try to get nectar from a flower and simply folded under it. It sat there for a long time, twitching as it tried to figure out what it had done wrong. The sight tugged hard at Delta's sobbing heart. No matter how devilish they looked, a sad bee was not acceptable. Delta got to work. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 68. World Wide Web. Mr. Jones put the test paper down and gazed up at the collection of people in his classroom. In one hand, he held the marked test of Dio. The boy sat in front where Jones could be completely sure that there was no chance that Seth, the water mage, was helping him from afar. Nor quiss, he didn't expect it from Seth, the man had pride, but he would almost gamble on its certainty with quiss. Tell me, how well do you think Dio did? He asked lightly. The question posed was an open-ended, but really took the direct question. Given the grin on Quiss's face, decent, she offered. Quiss tutted. Really, you may settle for decent, but I put Dio through a tough torturing session. I feel that he fared beyond expectations. He announced smugly. Seth gave him a blank look. You cannot teach beards to fly, he pointed out, and Jones blinked, but he hid the smile at the language barrier. He was getting better, but the man's butchery of the local language was rather endearing. Birds, birds, Quiss argued. Ducks, Seth beamed. Quiss's face soured. They take down the few lords and rule the local land for a few years and no one ever lets you forget it. He mumbled. Jones had no sympathy. Summoning dark drakes from the river Ton was just asking for trouble. Honestly, the man would be doing better just setting the poor people on fire. If they weren't so dark-like, even the Demon King would be content with them over the some points. Still, he saved that for another lesson. Dio, how do you think you did? He asked kindly, the boy grinned, and looked so happy as he spoke. Mr. Chris showed me as much and taught me a lot in the dungeon. I wrote down as much and really hope you're proud of me. I'm going back tomorrow to do more studying, and I'll bring homework on what I find. He said with his eyes lit up. Jones eyed the thirty pages of what should have been a six-page test at most. The boy certainly hadn't lacked answers. Jones also decided not to bring up that it was he who set the homework. It was choosing one's battles that got them through the day. He was about to speak when Dio carried on. I think I never had so much fun learning. I hope Rudy can show me more and I want to take Poppy and Amonster next time. He grinned and gathered up his pencils as if to make sure that he had enough resources for his self-assigned task. Jones put the paper down and sighed heavily. The room grew tense. Rudy, you may leave. Mr. Brondo has passed with flying colors. I will uphold my end of the deal. He smiled as if a little annoyed at the outcome, but not enough to raise a fuss. Rudy hollered and stood up, grabbing Seth kissing him hard before she threw him over the desk. Chris snorted. Grateful you are, he began, but Ruli did the same to him a moment later. She cheered and threw Chris out the window in her excitement. The window allowed for the world outside to be shown, and Ruli hopped through it, and hollered and yelled with joy as she ran away from the schoolhouse. I was just stabbed by a lady of power. Seth touched his lips, cheeks had flushed pink, Dio blinked. Ruli should have asked if you wanted to kiss. It is not right to kiss people unless they say yes. I have personal experience with that. He nodded seriously, and Jones merely watched the scene of light amusement. Dio, you may go home. Seth, you may go do whatever you wish. He ushered the two out of this room and closed the door, waving gently at Gio's bright smile and a promise of seeing him tomorrow. Such a good boy. Jones wandered over to his desk and flipped Dio's test over, and eyed the bright red 2 out of 100. The boy had ignored the questions and just written down what he had learned in the dungeon. Page after page of rambling notes and theories on what Delta the dungeon call might make next, or why she made what she did. But each word, every word, leaked joy of learning of this knowledge, seeing Dio's face when he couldn't wait to learn more. A teacher was his little musing and frustrating. As a demon of knowledge, it was a gift to see knowledge so enjoyed, 
so valued in its own merit and sheer childish enjoyment, Jones would be unable to accept anything less than a pass. Still, he wouldn't be able to go for a drink anytime soon. Seeing Quiss's smug expression would be a little too much, but maybe he could see this dungeon. He suspected this was the true source of Dio's curiosity. He breathed deeply as he felt the pressure to teach Rudy East. Her knowledge of dungeons would help Dio along his path. He need not teach her any more. She had graduated by proxy. How odd, and very much like Rudy. He opened the drawer and took out a bottle of deep amber liquid. The bottle had ribbons of deep dark metal woven around it as a skeletal system. He pulled out the top of the bottle and a deep crystal stone cork. Before he drank deeply as the yellow poster note floated to the floor, and it simply read, Drink to Dio's success. There was never any doubt on the success, just the matter of when. Chris watched as Ruli downed another mug of frothy ale. The froth gave her an elegant moustache. She sighed with a deep pleasure. I love being an adult. I can get wasted and no one will give a damn. She cheered as Seth sipped from the small glass of exotic spring water with spirits infused in it. Quiss took his time with his own ale. Not entirely true, Quiss stated with a glare, but Ruli dutifully ignored him like always. No one ruins her buzz. So, I feel like I was gone for like a week. What did I miss? Ruli asked. Quiss thought in it. Me, Dabagast Dio, and his mother all went on an adventure as we had to escort the taxman about. We saw the full second floor and discovered the secret boss. There were also another bunch of unique and upgraded monsters. Quiz summed up as the bartender brought another round. He looked sour. Really? Second floor, huh? What's wrong with you, huh? She jabbed a finger at the tender, and he growled. There was another pub nearby. I can sense it. He stomped away. All three of them blinked. That's weird magic power. Imagine living in a big city if you can sense how many blokes you pour your pint. Ruli huffed and Seth looked pained. Like having many swords in my nose, he agreed. That guy is the only pub in this town. I always wondered why. Chris trailed off before Ruli nudged him. So, what's the second floor boss? Is it a frog, a bee, a giant mime? She giggled as she drank more. Chris brought up a memory. It's a weirdly sexy tree. He summed up, Seth and Ruli gave him a long look. I'm a gonna need you to explain that, Ruli stated bluntly as she pushed her hair back so that she could lean on the table. Quiz gave her a huff of annoyance. A female tree with curves and a personality of a murderer. It is the most dungeon thing Delta has ever made to date. Not like dryads, this thing is an actual tree. He tried to explain, Ruli thought about it. Like crashing cypresses or rough rowans. But with, you know, she jiggled her body with both men looked away, not taking the bait. It's something that you have to experience. I bet you're heading there before long. Just, we saw something in the waterfall. Something huge. Quiz's eyes went distance. How bad could it be? Rudy dismissed. Quiz stared her right in the eyes. It made Dabagast excited. Ruli's wooden mug cracked as she gripped it. Something in the water made... Holly, excited, Rooney repeated and then she began to chuckle as she drank her ale from the new crack at the bottom. The deranged look in Rooney sometimes got when her demon blood got boiling appeared and Seth inched slightly away. I can see it now, Delta bans everyone, Rooney is never seen again as she refuses to leave. Quiz mused almost hopeful, Seth looked between them and snorted. Who needs unfriends when I have people of love like you? He sighed. Try now, Delta coached. The large monster of a bee settled onto the large flower. There was a moment of held breath before it settled without breaking. Delta cheered and distilled as her new plant shifted. The problem of trying to supermutate a plant was not without consequences. Blooming Rinse has been exposed to a large amount of mana and evolved into a a vase plant. The flower was a weird one. It actually drew earth up through its roots and formed a central stone pillar for the plant to grow up. It was a weird reversal of the plant held the soil material like a leafy vase, and the rock peeking out over the rim of the plant's highest point as the grayish liquid turned solid. 
and formed more of a stone centre. Delta was pleased, however, it didn't have teeth nor did it have thorny vines to assault people in their sleep. That was her main worry done and gone. Now, if it just stopped trying to grow into a large spire that matched the bee's spires. It works, a large bees will be able to gather more as it grows. As New pointed out, Data frowned. It's still dangerous. It has some weird acid that melts rocks and dirt. Like, if someone hacks at it, it might be rain out all over people. But this is my first attempt. She had to remind herself. At least the bees weren't sad anymore. She'd set up a warning sign for the plants in a little bit. She looked up at something, as her gobs returned. Flying to the entrance she watched was a growing horror, as the goblins brought a huge spider through the entrance. It dissolved immediately, but Delta could only watch as the goblins rushed out again to get another one that they'd killed. Her manner and DP skyrocketed. Her goblins looked to her with white smirks. You guys, the greats! You didn't take any bad risks, right? She demanded, but both gobs looked confident. Spiders are easy. They trapped them with hub tracking, and I broke their legs off. Gob guffawed. Delta nodded as she watched them praise each other. So the spiders weren't smart, or at least the lowest spider soldiers were still animalistic as far as Delta knew. Her mana and DP had shot up to 20 and a piece of those spiders, and she blinked at the number. The last spider did not garner nearly as many points. Had they changed since the last time she'd seen them? Or had Delta's goblins actually found a spider of a higher order without noticing? Great work, guys. That really helps. I'll tell Farrah to give you both free drinks for the night. She clapped her hands and smiled as the goblins cheered loudly. They rushed off and Farrah sent her a disgusted feeling but accepted the free drink order. Farrah liked to hear the clink of coin the clunk of mushroom, and the swishing of webs. Overall, Farron liked making money, even when it was technically not money. Delta hoped to get Maestro to put good music in the place soon. He just needed time to go through Delta's large library of uh, acquired tastes. Delta had enough of butterflies for an hour. It was a good song to grind with a high score to, but hearing it over and over as Maestro begged for a machine like the one in her head was just soul-crushing. The idea of Maestro forcing poor adventures on DDR machines was amusing, but Delta could barely make basic things, let alone more complex machines. Delta grinned as she floated around the first floor and blinked as she found herself in the mushroom grove, watching as Bori snoozed away the day. She hadn't been in the mushroom grove for so long. She smiled and opened the menu. Mushrooms. Produce. Gut rot mushrooms, nine mana. Crunchy mushrooms, two mana. A slightly odd mushroom that, while not at all good, can provide some nutrition, leaves an aftertaste that lingers. Lumen mushrooms, one mana. Blood curdling mushrooms. This mushroom has moved down a level and evolved due to the mana strain. If devoured, the eater will suffer body convulsions, sweat, visions, and some other minor things. This will render them bedridden for a day, for a day or so, but at least this variety is no longer hazardous to burn. It's still foul, though. It is not fatal unless they keep eating them for some reason, but people can be unpredictable. Jungle. Starlight Mushroom, a mushroom of guidance that light up and gives away the comfort to travelers. A unique mushroom never seen before. Develop. Develop mushrooms with weak hallucinogenic properties, 6 dp. Develop mushrooms with deadlier poison, 44 dp. Develop a tastier and more nourishing mushroom, 10 dp. Develop a mushroom that grants restful sleep, 10 dp, unlocked with sand elf dust. Develop a herbal mushroom that grants a low-level healing effect to those who eat it, 15 dp, unlocked by Wyam Tree. Develop a mushroom that gives people a warm cheer in their stomach as they make them drunk, 20 dp, unlocked by Goblin Tavern. Make a mushroom that makes mana regen faster, 20 dp. Develop a mushroom that causes aggression to be lowered, 15 dp, unlocked due to the nature of the dungeon. Develop a mushroom of fire that burns those who eat it and can be used as a fire starter, 20 dp. 
Dada blinked at the growing list of new mushrooms. Sure, it had been a while since she had poked her nose in here, but the sheer amount of new mushrooms was making her feel like she should be popping in more often. Combined with the minor things that Hob and Gob also managed to find, Delta was well off in the mana and DP. Mana 55, DP 52. Delta knew that she would wait before spending all her DP, but some of these were really good. The sheer rate that the other mushrooms spread, Delta might not have to purchase them in bulk or them to be found in bountiful amounts. Delta tried to reason out the pros and cons of her new ones. She was still not pleased about the magical mushrooms or the deadlier one. The tasty mushroom was nice, along with the restful mushroom. If they were all cooked together, would it be a perfect supper soup? Delta swallowed her drool and focused. She wouldn't mind eating something, anything, even mushrooms. A healing mushroom was good. If people understood its use, then they could farm them and show the world that Delta made nice mushrooms, not just cut rot on blood-curdling ones. She had a feeling that having drunk adventurers might be a bad idea, but Farrah could harvest them as a bruise and mushroom peer. Delta hoped that no little folk would find her dungeon. She didn't have enough mushrooms when they got hungry. The mild piece making mushrooms sounded cute. Delta could also decide that she did not want the fire starter mushroom when most of her floors were made of wood and green things. Delta amused for seconds longer before she purchased the tasty mushroom and the herbal one. The tasty mushroom has been created. The shimmering mushroom has been created. Delta watched as two mushrooms burst out of the soil of the mushroom grove. The first must be the tasty mushroom. It was a mushroom that was a white cap that looked like a natural pepper on the skin. The tiny black powder was actually pigments, but it made the thing look enticing rather than off-putting. The stalk was a pale yellow, and the slight slickness made it look buttery. The other one had a more esoteric design. The fungus pulsed with a soft green light. The cap looked more like a woven threads of a fine cloth than any spongy material. At the edge of the cap, those threads hung loose, slightly shimmering in the green light, catching the eye. Bori woke up and gave both mushrooms a long look. See, I can do this whole mushroom thing without going horribly wrong. Delta nodded to herself. Bori gave her a long look before he snapped down and swallowed both mushrooms. There was a moment where Delta gaped. I just made those, she said before Bori's snout flared and his eyes lit up. On his back, two more mushrooms emerged and joined the rest. They were the mushrooms that she had just made. Bori quickly went back to sleep and Delta watched as the scene with a long look. They're going to groan on their own now, but... What the hell, pig? At least save one for later. She chided and paused as something peeked out from under the bush nearby. It was a dark mushroom. Delta twitched as the blood-curdling mushroom seemed to be looking around its new home. They migrated, she hissed, and with some hope she waited. Sure enough, a starlight mushroom appeared and tried to block the black mushroom from seeing the mushroom grove. I really have got to do something about them. Sister. Remind me to do something about them. She called out and left the room, eager to spot her new mushrooms sprouting. In her sphere of existence, Sis looked at the order and blinked. She adjusted herself on the wooden chair as that was her only object. Fix them. Are they not working properly? She asked herself and pulled up the information on both mushrooms. The screens were basic, but they had odd symbiosis going on, in that when one grew, the other did as well. Delta wanted them to not be so connected. Sis pulled a few screens around and tried to ignore the sparking screen, which controlled monster templates. The window was completely orange in the data and the words were now gibberish. Sis liked it. It was different. The new window showed that they were more akin to enemy tribes fighting for the supremacy than lifting in coexistence. Delta had brought this one herself, but Sis could fix this. She really was sure that she could. She perked up and dug into the automatic conjuration system, a minor part that waited for the clock to count down on endlessly different projects before the produced an item. She nudged the central control. It acknowledged her. I need you to add this to the next two batches of M2BC and M2SM. Thanks. She smiled and shut the hatch. 
The request was not needed, the talking was not needed, the eye contact was not needed. But Sis wanted to try it once. Talking to New was fun. Watching Delta talk to her creations and the systems was fun. Sis. It was all Sis. It was like putting hand puppets on two hands and making them talk to each other. But in the act of trying to pretend it was another being, something happened. The central control had held the two instructions for a moment before it gingerly did what it was told. It hesitated, tried to slot them in before it paused, and finally turned them upside down and put them into the line of processing. Sis had not made it act confused. Sis hadn't seen that they were upside down. Sis peered into the hatch with wide eyes and a huge smile. Then she looked over at the floor on her space. The hundreds and thousands of hatches of different sizes and colors all briefly lit up in the darkness. There was Sis, but she could always pretend for a while. Delta stood up and frowned. Where are my darn mushrooms? She asked and then laughed. The day I asked that is the day I've gone loony. She admitted and looked around the storeroom. The shelves had random objects from her dungeon and a small jar of honey from the bees, an empty mug from Freya's bar, some boar hair. The storeroom had been collecting things, it seemed. A challenge for Mary was still there and a reminder Delta that she had so much to do. But the second fall was so close to completion, well, the basic idea. She had so much to experiment with and so little resources. What do you expect when you let the dungeon's most common food keep walking away? We both know there would never be easy if you chose this path. Spiders offer a good way of supplying us with energy for now. I suggest that we send the gobs out more often to get more rare types. Dalta shook her head. We take what they bring. They aren't a hunting party. They can't handle too much. She reminded and new screens turned to her. Dalta, forgive me for being blunt, but you have a party. Dalta tilted her head with a frown. Onwards, follow Gob. Hob pointed and Delta watched as Hob and Gob left the dungeon with Rennie in tow. In his arms, Rennie carried waddles like a loving pet. I just sent two goblins and possibly an evil duck and a mime out to kill spiders. Delta said hoarsely, We shall grab Ruli and Dio later. Then it should truly be a raid party. Yeah, a raid on my sanity. I just hope no one else sees them. I don't even know how to explain it, Delta muttered. Ruli held her fishing rod limply to one side as the odd party marched out of the dungeon. The goblin sang loudly as the mine patted the duck and they vanished into the distant woods as Ruli's eyed her other hand which held a bottle of dark booze. There was a moment of pause before she simply shrugged and took another swig. Quizzer's stuff is good, she burped. She took a few more lumbering steps after the party. She liked that duck. It hung out in her pond. Ducky! She called, falling flat on her face as she caught a root. She looked up, and a wide grin spread over her face. Ducky, ducky! She laughed, face so red, and she looked feverish. She got up and pushed the tree out of the way as she chased after the group. The tree fell and began to roll down to the climb towards the dungeon. New, the giant trees are back. The deep in the dark. The darkness inside the giant web in the middle of the spider's lair paused. It felt uneasy. It dismissed this as after effect of the change. Awareness and emotions were not a welcome gift. It was just getting excited as the tunnel grew closer to completion. Mila watched the distant horizon. A carriage from some sort of people on horseback took a long winding path towards Durance. Young, excited, eager, unprepared. It had begun. Nolan would not reach the king until at least a week or so from now. But any inn or village he stayed in, the news spread. A party had come to seek Delta's riches. What fools. Mina merely walked back towards her home and saw that everyone was on there watching the streets. Each watched those flickering torches grow closer. The world that they had run from had finally decided to come to them. Well... At least things were not going to be boring. Delta alone provided ample change to the usual dynamics. She wondered how long this peaceful act would last. Until she was driven mad? Or would she change everything?
in a loft and raised one hand in the direction of the dungeon. Good luck, little girl. You're going to need it, she grinned. The stars twinkled as if agreeing. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link to below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.